Jana Polaka Williams is a child psychotherapist and analyst. And for many years, she was a consultant psychotherapist in the adolescent department of the Tavistock Clinic, where she still teaches. She's taught child psychotherapy and set up trainings based on the Tavistock model all over the world. And she's written over 30 books over the past 50 years. Her enduring interest has been in the helpful and unhelpful characters that inhabit children's internal landscapes. Mm. And it was through that that a, a famous paper that's called Doubly Deprived was published in 1974, which has now become a child psychotherapy classic. Mm. And it was around about that time, Jana, wasn't it, that there was a greater understanding about the psychopathology of mm. severely... Uh, deprived children was starting to emerge. So what led you to, to write this paper? Well, I actually wrote this paper without realising at the time that somehow it was breaking new ground <laughs> because uh, I was <clears throat> seeing this uh, adolescent and uh, I was finding the work initially very, very difficult and actually asked for supervision of my work. And uh, I came to realize something important that uh, has helped me a lot also in the future. And that was that uh, this child was treating me like a wimp, like a nuisance who is trying to get some of his attention. And uh, I was helped to understand that uh, what he was doing was really to turn me into an aspect of himself he could not tolerate. Indeed. So he, he used to persecute pa pa children from Pakistani backgrounds? Yes, and to point a knife at their throat and then say they are inferior, they are mm -hmm. savages, not like mm -hmm. us, British. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he was talking mm -hmm. to me, saying, mm -hmm. not that. <laughs> so maybe give us a little bit of background. So what I love about your writing is that you paint a very vivid picture of these children that, that you have seen. Um, so to tell us about Martin and what his background was, which gives us some idea of then what, what led to his presentation with you. Well, uh, Martina had been deprived by his life and as I realised by understanding the way he had protected himself from psychic pain was also inwardly deprived. I, I think that uh, I described him as uh, using defences that turned him into an orphan inside himself as well as outside. So he, he was in a children's home for two years, then he had very unsuccessful fostering, but the foster parents kept him until the age of 12. So from the age of two to the age of 12, he was with foster parents. They gave him up because of a number of difficulties, including continuous stealing from them, but also because he had tried to jump from a second floor window. And it looked like quite a serious suicide attempt, which fortunately was prevented. But it is after that that they decided he should go back to a children's home. So when I started seeing him at the age of 14, he had been for two years in the children's home. His defences were already present, definitely in a big way, when he left the foster parents, because when the foster mother tried to talk with him on the phone, he behaved as if nothing had happened, while she had to stop the telephone call because she was crying so much. So that was an example of these brick wall defences that he had developed. And the brick wall defences were present with me as well, so it took me a very long time to establish contact with him. And uh, at first I, I found it difficult to know how to react when he was telling me 
uh, I've got no time for your rubbish, uh, soft, you're uh, tough, you've got to suffer, uh, you're talking to a brick wall. And then eventually I was uh, enabled also by some supervision to understand that uh, what he was doing was not a just, just an attack, it was a communication. And the communication is what he was making me feel. That is, that he was making me feel like a very wimpy type of child who is trying to get somebody's attention. And this somebody has got better things to do than listen to him. Now, this was something that uh, then I understood to be a picture of something that was in the internal landscape of Martin. There was a sort of parent who he perceived as not, not a, a, at all able to give attention. And there was the wimp who was trying to get attention. The wimp was put totally into me. And uh, I think it was part of our work for me to put him in touch with this more vulnerable part, vulnerable part of himself. But it could be done only very gradually. And not to take the way he was treating me as an attack, but as a communication. This is, I think, that's been the essential aspect. So this is the definition of doubly deprived, that the, the first deprivation is... External. The, so the circumstances he was born into and what happened to him yes. as a child. And then the second deprivation is the what happens in the, in, with the internal defences mm -hmm. that stop a child from taking in what they need to receive from others. Yes. And in fact, that was evident in his great difficulty in taking in from the foster parents and uh, somehow uh, he said once uh, I don't miss anybody people miss me and that put it in a nutshell he had created this sort of carapace so that people would give him up so just like the foster parents did and every rejection cemented the hardness of this uh, internal, uh, I refer to it as an internal object, which was, you know, the parent that has got no time for him. So every rejection made that object more uh, sort of harder, harder and harder. And uh, the wimp sort of more and who were needy, uh, but uh, it was very painful for him eventually to allow these more needy parts and he became very demanding, he said I should be like restaurants that are open 24 hours, 24 7. Meaning you should be yeah. open to him whenever he wants to see you. Yes, and if I put him in touch with the pain of having missed mm -hmm. something, then I should give it to him yeah. in the present. And so it, it was a very difficult journey. Mm -hmm. I, I know you, you said that Martin said to you, if it hurts, how can you call it getting better? Yes, so that, that is again one of his very incisive communications yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because um, I, I think uh, he became more open to experience pain. Mm. When um, he was 16, he had to leave the children's home and uh, was, I think, quite attached to the, the parents. It was the, the people, the house parents, wasn't it, who ran the home? Yes, the mm. house parents, and he said he would move only if he could take them with him. And, uh, I mean, he, he, he was very damaged by his defences because uh, he, had, he was 14 years old when I saw him and he had a reading age of six. And this really helped me also to think about another area of my interest, which is how so many learning problems 
depend from an, a, an emotional uh, obstacle that uh, I would put in a nutshell as not being able to think about where it hurts and why it hurts. And if you can't make that link, I, I'm sure that this can be a big impediment in learning to read and write and uh, all that Martin hadn't been able to do eventually. He, he actually did develop a capacity also to be literate. <laughs> And it's the dependency, I think you said, that mm. that it's an unwillingness or incapacity to be able to depend on others that stops mm. the learning process to being able to let in others. Yes, and I think that uh, here we return to if it hurts, how can you uh, call it getting better? Because I think that if you depend on some somebody, this somebody becomes important, becomes precious. And what I think is at the source of many pathologies is defences that prevent you to make another person painfully precious. So that I think was very clear mm -hmm. with Martin. Mm -hmm. He had managed yeah. to avoid making mm -hmm. anybody painfully yeah. precious for a mm -hmm. long time. And when he was mm. more open yeah. to the pain of loss yeah. and separation, it was yeah. as if I had stripped what he called the seven layers of skin that covered the soft spot. So there was something... I mean, he didn't say that, but uh, he had told me at the beginning that he had seven mm. layers of skin that covered the soft spot. And I think uh, perhaps... I felt when I realized that he was in pain that I'd been doing something that might make him richer from the emotional point of view and also from the learning point of view, obviously. I find that really moving, actually, what you've just said, um, because there's a real dichotomy at work, isn't there? That in, in trying to help children recognize the defenses that are unhelpful, we're also leaving them more undefended and yes. more in touch with their pain. Yes, and I think that this is why it is so important to be extremely careful in our interpretation of defences. I have developed over the years both in my work with children but then later now as a psychoanalyst I really feel that defences have to be respected and not stripped in a brutal way and that you can't expect anybody to drop crutches until you feel that they can walk. And uh, obviously in the work to help them to, to walk, even if there is one leg that is walking very well, but another one is damaged. You have to focus on what makes them limp before you can interpret something that might lessen the defences. And I also think that uh, my golden rule is never to interpret a defence if I haven't got an idea of what is the anxiety behind it and possibly talking the same breath about the defence and the anxiety behind it, so that I try to hold what I'm talking about. Can you give an example of that? Well, I, I think talking with, with Martin, for instance, told me that uh, I am the only person who has no feelings at times when uh, he had feelings because I was going to take a, a, a break, to have a holiday, and he kicked the radiator saying, call this central heating, is cold water running through a mass of metal. Now, obviously found my 
leaving him painful and uh, was trying to use this defense of saying, you know, you are cold and don't care at all. But uh, it was very thin. It was obviously that he was in pain. And so I could talk about the fact that there was this way of turning me into this cold-hearted person. But uh, it was because the anxiety that uh, my going away, obviously I couldn't talk in such large and psychoanalytic terms, but it, it was a way to protect himself from something that was very painful and it was important for me to hold the pain and hold the anxiety. The anxiety that if I was such a cold person I might not care about coming back mm. after a break. Mm. The threat of physical violence always being present with Martin. Mm -hmm. Even getting a knife out in sessions with you. Mm -hmm. And what I found really interesting was, well, <laughs> first of all, you, you, you didn't seem to be overly alarmed. I think a lot of people, a lot of therapists would be seeing a knife in a mm. session. Um, but what you said is it, it, that you felt it was really important that therapists should be able to tolerate something that their internal object hadn't been able to tolerate. Mm -hmm. Internal or external. Yes. yes, yes. The external object being his mother his father. Then foster parents. And then foster and so parents. Yes, but uh, I mean also that he was bringing his violence to a place where perhaps something could be done about it and not uh, threatening with knives the Pakistani children and terrifying them in school, which was one of the, uh, uh, the issues mm -hmm. for the referral. Now that doesn't mean that I suffer knives gladly <laughs> because uh, he was actually examined very carefully uh, before he entered the room. He had used the knife to, uh, to, to attack the cardboard box that I used to contain drawings, if he ever produced drawings, which he didn't. And, you know, there were mm. a, a few mm. of his, it was yeah. Martin's box. Yeah. So this is part of the Tavistock model, isn't it? That yes, the, to use a box, a box for each box, Which is a symbolic, yes. it has symbolic meaning, doesn't it? That this is right. a, the, the, of the container. Indeed. Um, and every and child has his own or her own box. Mm. And inside there's a few basic things. Yes, yeah, so and, well, and for a 14 year old, though, you would use different things mm -hmm. than for a three years old, obviously. Yeah. It, it did enough damage to the top of the box to say that we have to get a new box, we have to get a new Mrs. Henry, because at that time I was called Janna Henry. I wonder why doubly deprived has continued to be such an important part of every child psychotherapist's reading. Do, do you know why it's been so enduring? I think that probably is a rather hopeful paper because I don't think all deprived children, especially not all doubly deprived children, can respond to treatment. And I think I was up to a point lucky with Martin, but I think that as there has been, after the publication of that paper, a big research at the Tavistock, which was including a large number of deprived children with uh, different type of defenses, some, you know, being like Martin, but some, in fact, having developed very different defenses. The book is divided in sections, and it is a book on psychotherapy with severely deprived children showing that with many of them, good work has been possible. I think also, not doubly deprived only, but that book should be a central reading for child psychotherapists because it gives hope that uh, there isn't really damage in many cases that is beyond repair, mm -hmm. or beyond some repair. Yeah. Louise Emanuel, um 
built on your theory um, and wrote a paper about triple deprivation. Yes, which talks also about, I mean, the services and uh, all that uh, can, can make for deprivation. So the professional services are supposed to be supporting children yes. who don't adequately enough mm -hmm. because of the child's own deprivation. Yes. Yeah. Has that been a helpful extension of the understanding of your work, do you think? I think so, yes. Yeah. And I think including, you know, something that's so important, like the network. Yes, yeah. So I'm wondering whether this interest, early interest that you developed through um, children like Martin, um, that, that, grew, that built upon um, your understanding of defences, has really had an effect on... Um, your treatment of, of children and young people with eating disorders. Um, I mean, you're particularly interested, aren't you, in, in those um, children who are difficult to reach mm -hmm. and children with eating disorders are particularly difficult to reach, aren't they? Yes, and I think that there again we can look at uh, a defence that uh, I have written about and then I, I think is uh, possibly a helpful defence to start with, but can bring about very serious consequences. So it is, as I have suggested in the the book I, I, I wrote in the late 90s, and in the introduction I say that in a way all the cases I talk about are cases where the issue of establishing dependence on an object that could become really important and precious, therefore painfully precious, uh, is avoided. Uh, the cases that I've spoken about in terms of the no-entry defense are children who might have defended and protected themselves from something toxic because they might have received very difficult projections and a child cannot really metabolize projection, cannot be a container. I've suggested one should really talk about the receptacle, not a container when it comes to a child. And what gets into the child is not contained in beyond terms, container contained, is experience like a foreign body and one might protect oneself from foreign bodies, and that is very healthy. So no entry defences might be initially very healthy if they are in aid of not being too porous to projections, to toxicity. But then they might extend themselves, like the girl I, I spoke about when I wrote about the no entry mm -hmm. defence, would uh, had very good reasons to protect herself from projections. Mm -hmm. um, she she had. Is this Sally? Sally, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. And Sally had uh, a very very disturbed mother, who had almost been drowned by her father when she was a child during a row between the parents. And that developed this tremendous anxiety about drowning if she had a bath. And uh, Sally was asked to hold her hand when she was three years old while she had a bath. And uh, obviously the child could not contain this very psychotic anxiety because for, sadly Sally's mother was um, very se severely disturbed entry defence which might have had a healthy uh, beginning but then she could not accept food, she could not accept sounds, not even the sound of the telephone. In a way if we look at how she developed them we could see that uh, when she was a very small child she was confronted with having to cope with something a small child cannot cope with. Mm -hmm. And that was a mother who had very psychotic fears, very extreme anxiety. Uh, 
In particular, she was very frightened of drowning. This was due to something that happened to her when she was a child. But anyhow, in this sort of, it's the opposite of a Russian doll. There's not a containment going down a generation, but a sort of pouring out of projections going down the generation. So Sally defended herself from projections that could have been very toxic by becoming no entry. But then the no entry defense became much wider and uh, it included her anorexia, not taking in food, her dread of, uh, she was an adolescent and she had absolute dread at the thought of penetration. Uh, she couldn't allow loud sounds to enter her ears, like the alarm clock or the telephone. And it was so extensive that it became very damaging. So I think you described that as an introjection of omega function as opposed to alpha function, if we're looking at Biron's theory. Well, I think that uh, what I suggested is that a child who is contained and as somebody who makes emotional sense of his or her experiences, internalize something that organizes him or her. A child who has the opposite experience, which is not of being contained, but of being projected into, of receiving what Sally received when she had to hold her mother's hand mm. while she was having a bath, might internalize something opposite to alpha function, what I call omega function, which would be a disorganizing type of function. I was very interested in your tech, therapeutic technique with Sally. You have to mm. tread very, very carefully because I think because of this no entry as you describe it, that mm. you tiptoed up to her really in, in, in the work with her you described even the sort of language you use, the language you used as pastel rather than primary colours. Yes, that I think is, you know, something that one cannot write a script about. But I think that if you are confronted with a patient who com comes across as so fragile that you can't even touch her with a feather, the language also has to be as light as a feather, meaning that, I don't know, I can give an example. I mean, it would then come natural for me to say maybe rather than perhaps, you know, a sort of softer word. But, I mean, I obviously didn't plan it, but it came natural to somehow modulate the language to the fragility mm. of the patient. Mm. And I, I think that this is uh, true with mm. many no entry patients. You described it as a process of joint exploration and, and yes. actually using the analogy of food, putting a plate of food out on the table mm. it, in terms of the therapy, therapy that you were offering, and she could take it if she yes. wanted to, rather than being force-fed. And also that I understood with her, as uh, I saw her for an assessment, then uh, I referred her for more intensive treatment. At that time, I couldn't see her intensively myself. And uh, I was still thinking that this would be something good for so, someone like Sally. In fact, that didn't work. I think initially with people like her and with many no-entry patients, it is better to start work with only one session. So Sally eventually, 18 months after she had stopped her three times weekly uh, therapy, returned. And then I saw her uh, myself but once weekly and in fact I, I think that 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 was the coffee spoon it's not just the plate but the coffee spoon yeah. that she could take 
You've often talked about Rosenfeld's concept of the internal gang. And that's been yes. quite an important part of your thinking, hasn't it? Yes, I, it is something that I find very helpful. I mean, I have worked for so long in the adolescent department that I'm very familiar with uh, the gang dynamics that uh, many patients might be involved in at times. So that's the with, external gang, so that's the, yes. ga the gangs that they, they're mixing with. Yes, yeah. for instance, one of the adolescent department patients came with a member of his gang and uh, he was only given permission to come to the session if then he reported everything that happened in the session to the other gang members. And then obviously it took a bit of work, you know, to work through that. But I mean, he then eventually did stay in treatment. <laughs> and um, that there was something that has to do certainly with this uh, friend of his, friend in inverted court. And, uh, external issues, but also in this patient and in many others, there is something that, well, one can see it in action in many pathologies. I quoted adolescent because I think that what happens in uh, um, the case of an internal voice might take a much wider uh, a sort of shape and uh, it might be not just a voice but the presence of this really quite destructive structure and I think that it can be seen for instance in uh, drug addictions as something that uh, as a ringleader uh, which is the drug pusher outside but also something very similar inside that says you know come on and I'll make you happy and uh, you know there'll be no psychic pain there'll be no uh, painfully precious objects and uh, I am your friend because I give you this good thing that makes you better and uh, at times you have either a gang or a gang member even with very small children. I mean, the, I can think of a child on the uh, door of the, uh, the therapy room talking to a totally imaginary friend and having a conversation with the friend saying that what was he going to do, you know, to listen to the crap that woman was talking about. And he's uh, having a dialogue being both him, himself and the friend and eventually getting permission, saying that anyhow he wasn't going to listen to a word she was going to say. I mean, it's interesting that obviously the therapist, while this was happening, was also talking and interpreting. This is a case of supervised. And, but it was really such a clear image of a totally internal or, you know, imaginary friend. Yeah. At times you find that there is a real gang that doesn't allow the patient to give up the membership, you know, like you can't get out of the mafia and say, sorry, you know, I'll give you back my membership. Mm -hmm. And uh, they become more ferocious at times, these gang members, when the patient is trying to get out. Mm -hmm. So the introduction of a good object in, and, and you're helping with that in the therapeutic work, it's a very, very painful process, isn't it? Well, I think that we return to, to Martin and I think indeed it is yeah. because uh, what uh, the gang or the drug pusher or even the voice that encourages the anorexia is promising is absence of psychic pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems to be not a very fair bargain to say, come to me and <laughs> you know, I will take you mm -hmm. away from this mm -hmm. uh, bad internal company, mm -hmm. but then there'll be a lot of pain, but mm -hmm. then something else comes with the psychic pain that it make, makes the, the process worth it. I mean, 
all of us have also had our experience of being in analysis, if we are in this type of work, and yeah. obviously, but we do know that change can be quite painful, but worthwhile. You've written very interestingly about um, babies who are poor feeders, mm-hmm. and and again, I think it's these internal defences and external realities, um, which. Um, provide very difficult circumstances for for babies very early on in their lives. And there's a baby in particular um, who you call Patrick, um, who had three older siblings who had died before him. And his mother expected him to die too. Yes, she said that uh, she couldn't really get attached to him because Mm. she was sure he was another one to go. Mm -hmm. And one can understand her anxiety because she had lost babies. So I'm interested to to hear from you how that affected something so fundamental as feeding in Mm -hmm. Patrick. Well, it was in the observation of uh, the student, whose name is Maria Angela Pinero, she's now returned to Brazil, and uh, she was seeing children who were in a London hospital and uh, were inpatient, it was a very long time ago, because they, they had failures to thrive or, you know, feeding difficulties mm-hmm. that were serious enough to, to put their life in danger in some cases. Mm-hmm. So that uh, she worked with mother and child, it was a mother-infant really type of intervention. Mm-hmm. And when she went home, and Patrick was still quite difficult to feed, she actually describes very graphically how he was still spitting the food out. It was taking some, but spitting the food out, and actually throwing it all over the, the kitchen. And the words were plastered with the food thrown by, by Patrick. So, so the walls were symbolic of this situation, very, very messy. Yes, and uh, I think, yes, very disorganised, and probably he was full of something very disorganising, because, I mean, Biono, as an analyst I I find very useful, says the most important anxiety a mother should hold is the fear, he puts it in terms, the fear that the baby may die. So it is this anxiety about death, and that was the contrary, it was not containing a fear of death, but actually projecting a fear of death. So So. this is a failure in the container function, and also an unwillingness of Patrick to depend on his mother, because he felt that he couldn't. Yes, I think... It was unsafe. I think that in his case, uh, he, he felt somehow not only rejected because uh, uh, the mother in fact couldn't look after him, the father was mostly looking after Patrick because she was so frightened that he was another one to go. But uh, I, I think she felt probably very vulnerable uh, and, you know, <laughs> in a way very unsafe. So this is a case where I would draw link between what happened externally and uh, the reaction of the child, which seems to be very linear. But that's not what I I would do in in every case. I don't think because of this deprivation, this will be the consequence, because I think that there is really a very uh, large range. I know you're very concerned that that parents often feel really blamed for when things go wrong with their children. Yes, well, I think that this is something I've been interested in for a long time because I'm convinced that uh, there are very different reactions in different children to even to the same circumstances and uh, 
don't know, shall I give you an example of Please what do. made me think of that? Uh, not only my clinical work, but I found such a graphic example when I saw an exhibition of children drawings and uh, there had been a flood in the village where they lived. This was in Italy. And the flood was not serious. No life was lost. But the a teacher as suggested told the children produced it produce a drawing of this experience. Now one drawing was absolutely catastrophic because there was water up to the bell tower of the village and there were dangerous fish and it was you know a, a river there were sharks. Then another picture was very cheerful. There were children paddling in the water with the red boots and it looked really, you know, very, very cheery. Uh, a, a third one that comes to mind was very hopeful because there was a cellar and the cellar there were provisions and the child was helping a father to bring provisions up from the flooded cellar mm. to, you know, the, mm. the ground. And uh, there was this helpful figure of the father. So just looking at the way different children experience the same event, I, I think gave me a very graphic picture of what I'm trying to say, which is that it's very difficult to say this experience will produce necessarily this effect. And I don't think one can always say, you know, this child is suffering because of something. Mm -hmm. The parents went wrong. In some cases, cases of abuse mm -hmm. or, you know, cases where, like in the case of Patrick, it was clear that the mother was very disturbed and the mother of Sally also was not very helpful to Sally. Uh, I think that I'm not excluding that what the parents do might have an impact, but I feel we shouldn't generalize saying that the same experience has the same impact of every child. I'm interested in how you've applied psychoanalysis to different settings and helping people who are not therapists work mm -hmm. with children. I'm thinking about your work in Mexico with mm -hmm. street children. Well, that is in a way a continuation of my interest in double deprivation because many of these street children were indeed very doubly deprived. But uh, psychotherapy could not be provided. I was asked to visit this uh, uh, NGO uh, because the NGO, which is called Together with the Children, Juntos con los Niños, uh, was um, uh, aware that they needed more input in order to understand the emotional problems of the children. It wasn't enough to teach them to read and write and to give them food. And I mean, what uh, I applied in that case was an, an idea it's not mine, it is Martha Harris, or the group working with Martha Harris in the 60s that has developed. She was this. at the Tavistock, wasn't she? She was yeah. the organising tutor mm. of the course in, in, in psychological observational mm. studies, which I then inherited from her, mm. and of the clinical training, the four years clinical training, which follows mm. that course. And, uh, I mean, what they suggested that one could do in family centres, which don't exist any longer, but there were family centres where you could help um, both the children individually and also the parents to sit with the child for 45 minutes with a box, which again had this symbolic meaning with the child's name on it, and usual contents, but the technique was different as it was mainly based on giving one's absolutely full attention to the child, not asking too many questions or any if possible, and just receiving and at times 
trying to make a link maybe between the child's play and also something that one might know was happening in the la child's life outside mm -hmm. by passing the actual here and now of, of the work with the therapist. Mm -hmm. Also because in Mexico what we did was that each child could have, because of resources, only 35 uh, sessions of special time. And then when they wanted to have another special time, they put their name down and the, the next um, educador, you know, the next person who might be available might not be the same. So it was important not to intensify too much the relationship, mm -hmm. although obviously mm -hmm. it became important. Mm -hmm. The most important thing was to prepare those children to the ending of the special time. So many things in their life had finished abruptly. Uh, you know, it was a, mm -hmm. a child who was confronted suddenly with having to uh, sit with the child, the father who had gone to the United States, as many Mexicans do, had been killed in a fight in the United States, had been sent back to Mexico, and uh, the mother of, of his father, his grandmother, was looking after him, didn't have the heart to sit there. So he was left alone with a dog for a whole day with his dead father, whom he had never seen. and. Uh, children who have had this type of experiences really need to be helped to get close to the end of whatever experience very gently and gradually. So, so one this of the aspects of special times is that... So it's the preparation of the ending, but I'm, I'm interested, so you're working with teachers or the people working with these children in, 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 in the home? Or, or yes, they... well, we tried to involved in special time, people who were not all the time mm. very involved with the children, like mm. the house mother or house mm. father of the children's mm. home. But anyhow, when I first went to Mexico, in, first, in fact, I took part in what is called Operación Amistad, mm. the, the befriending of mm. the children. and. Uh, it was a while ago, so I was more agile and sat on the floor of the bus station at night where the mm -hmm. educators were befriending children who may or may not come to the home. Right. Children are very suspicious also because of traffic or mm -hmm. yeah. all sorts of good reasons. Mm -hmm. it takes mm -hmm. a long time. So if people are interested then, in learning more about this technique of special mm -hmm. time and teaching being, and, and people who are working with children in in a, in a non-therapeutic environment. Mm. Is there some way they can find out more information about it? Well, there are a few papers, and mm. I have written one of them um, in a, a book called Work Discussion, mm. edited by uh, Rostin and Bradley. But in fact, I am in the process of writing a book on special time with an Italian colleague. I'm interested in what drew you to become a child psychotherapist? I, I, I think that initially I was, mm -hmm. I, I was studying philosophy and I was going to write a thesis mm -hmm. on the possible metaphysical foundation of the concept of the unconscious. I mean, all sorts of very theoretical interests that were covering my attraction for... So was that a defence, do you think? I think it was, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and I was initially thinking mm -hmm. that I was having analysis because I was training and so on. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, you know, very, very glad and thank my mm -hmm. lucky stars that mm -hmm. uh, I also had myself for opportunity to have analysis. But what, what particular contribution uh, or aspect of your work do you feel has made a difference to children? Well, I, I hope, as uh, after W.D. Pride was published, there has been, you know, this research opening up the hope that children that uh, deprived, as Martin was, can be helped. I think uh, this is probably 
something that uh, might have, you know, had some influence. I also think that as I started courses in child psychotherapy in Italy, and there are now 400 child psychotherapists in Italy, and uh, I also worked in uh, Turkey, where there is now a child psychotherapy training, but that is uh, not established to child psychotherapy training, but I started things there. And I've introduced infant observation in various places in Latin America. So I think I've had, you know, a sort of wish to export what I felt to be good to various places. And the person who has influenced me the most, probably, is uh, Martha Harris, whom I mentioned earlier on. And I remember a, a sentence of hers, which I might not remember by heart, but uh, I think she says, um, psychoanalytic ideas should travel and uh, find fertile lands where to, to flourish, something very similar. And I think I've been very lucky in finding many fertile lands. You have. And including been... my country of origin. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What hope do you have for psychoanalytic child psychotherapy moving forwards? Well, I don't know if we want to get into, you know, the hornet nest of what is the future of psychoanalysis mm. and how uh, it might be difficult mm. to use psychoanalytic mm. work in the future. Mm. I mean, I, I have my heart in psychoanalytic work so that I hope, you know, indeed, with all my heart, that uh, um, work which uh, helps children to find a meaning of their suffering, which is how I think I would put it. Well, I think I've been looking for meaning first in philosophy and then I realized that for what I was concerned, it helped me a lot to find meaning in psychoanalysis. And I hope that one will continue to be able to help children and adolescents and adults as well, but, um, you know, get that child psychotherapy might co co continue to help children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in this respect, mm -hmm. to find a meaning mm -hmm. and uh, to become more able to enrich their relationships mm -hmm. without too much fear of having rich relationships. Yeah. And do you think that this is really what, the most important task of a therapist is to help children do that? Well, I think that perhaps I would put it in terms of a child psychotherapist being internalised as a, a, a good presence which joins in with other good uh, characters of the child in the child internal world to sustain the child to bear conflicts and difficulties and nevertheless develop and uh, you know o open up to the riches of life including relationships <laughs> well thank you very much for talking with me jana I've really enjoyed it and, I'm, and I think I speak for very, very many other child psychotherapists in thanking you for your contribution to child psychotherapy. It's been invaluable. Thank you. I enjoyed talking with you.